Welcome everyone. This is the Garden Club of Jacksonville's Horticulture Corner. And our program is on rose therapy today featuring Pam Greenwald. And we are so excited to have her here today along with lots of beautiful examples of her plants. And I wanted to introduce myself. I am Denise Reagan. I'm the executive director of the Garden Club of Jacksonville. And I'm here with Daniel Stark, our admin assistant who is manning the camera and the audio system. We're so happy to have him here as well. And we could not be here without the support of the Jesse Balji Pond Fund, whose generous grant is helping support hybrid programs just like this one. I'd also like to thank our Horticulture Corner Chair, Brenda Daly. She helped us put together a great series of programs um, this year and uh, will continue, hopefully, in the future. We have another uh, Horticulture Corner pro program coming up on April 13th on Native Parks with Nicholas Freeman, who helped put together the parks that are in Riverside Avondale, Native Park 1 and 2. Sounds like a really fascinating program, and uh, he'll be talking about uh, how you can plant native plants in your yard. If you're not already, already a member of the Garden Club of Jacksonville, why not? It's a perfect time to join. If you are one, thank you so much for being a member. And it's a really great time to be a member, not only because we need you and we love to have you at programs just like this one, but it's also great because uh, we have an open call for board applications. And uh, Daniel's going to put some links into the chat that uh, will help you that with that. Um, on our blog is a blog about how you can join our board. So please look that up and uh, let us uh, know if you're interested. All right, I'm going to introduce Pam Greenwald now. Pam started Rose Garden Angels, a nonprofit that uses horticultural therapy for mental, physical, and spiritual healing. The organization works with veterans suffering from PTSD and other combat-related disabilities to grow roses, which are sold to create a source of income for the participants. The program is designed to improve the participants' independence by developing or enhancing stress management techniques emotional balance and psychological well-being through working with nature. Pam is here today with Tate and Hale, a veteran from Orange Park who also works with Rose Garden Angels. So you'll get to see both of them today. And if you have questions for Pam or Tate, please and Zoom put them on the chat. And if you're here in person, we have a microphone up in the corner for you to go up after the program is completed. All right, so with that in mind, we're going to go to Pam and her slides. Great, Pam, take it away. Thank you, thank you. Is, uh, check, 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 is that okay? Okay, so um, we only have an hour instead of five hours, which is too bad. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna talk kind of fast, but I'll probably uh, leave out some things that I didn't mean to. How many in this room and in the Zoom room uh, grow roses now? Please raise your hand. I'd just like to get an idea. Okay, it looks like a good many of you do. And um, I'm, that's nice. And um, just like to, to see, I, wanna, I like to bust myths, rose myths a lot too, which I'm going to be doing. But first I want to talk about um, our program. So uh, Angel Gardens, which is my rose nursery, started in 2005. Uh, Angel Gardens was, beginning was a, a garden boutique in Gainesville on 441 in 1991. So for 16 years, I had a garden shop. And so I sold all the plants. I was an avid gardener. Uh, we had classes, we did it all. It was before you know, modern times. We we were one of the early, one of the earlier uh, organic uh, um, promoters, and um, I grew. I, I mean, I sold the old garden roses at the shop. So um, when my suppliers started drying up a little bit from different reasons, I won't go into. I thought, well, maybe I could try to grow them. So I would throw the. Uh, rose cuttings into a bathtub in the back of the shop and I couldn't believe you know they would root and of course the roots would go like three miles through the bathtub 
And, um, but that's when I realized they weren't that hard to grow. And so I started growing them in the back of the shop. And um, then when we sold our shop property and got tired of retail uh, uh, after so many years. And so I took the whole Rose operation home and we kept the name Angel Gardens because it was a corporation and everybody had the phone number and, you know, we'd been in business for so long. So that's how I got started in the rose business, started growing them and becoming obsessed with roses and collecting roses from all sources and staying up all night reading about roses and breathing and eating roses until finally I ended up with about 2000 varieties and, you know, grow, 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 grow. Um, I also about 15 years ago became an ordained minister and um, it was uh, when you became, when you, it was funny because our, uh, uh, symbol of that is the rose. And so right at the same time that I was really getting into roses, I'm taking the oath of the rose and getting ordained. So it became sort of like a ministry. And um, one of the things we got when we uh, became ordained was a, a federal EIN number uh, because it was federally recognized and we were able to have, it's like a church. You know, they gave you a, um, a 501c3 automatic. So I spent 10 years trying to decide what I wanted to do with that. And um, finally, somehow it hit me one day, you know, that, that I wanted to use it with what I was doing. So the best way to do that was to, to show other people how much fun and easy it was to grow roses. And so I decided I would do that, do horticulture therapy. And that's how Rose Garden Angels was born. And um, Actually, my daughter and son-in-law have worked for Wounded Warrior Project here in Jacksonville for many, many years. And so Wounded Warrior Project gave me the seed money to start. And um, I was able to, um, actually, I started uh, originally, I was going to do it with all kinds of people, kids, seniors, develop me dis developmental disabled, veterans, everybody. And I did a kids program. It was nice. Uh, I worked with an addict. It wasn't so nice. In the end, it was the veterans that really stood out and really showed me that they were the, that was the group I wanted to work with. They were disciplined. They were loyal. <laughs> they were wonderful people. And I really didn't know any veterans in my life. And I don't have any relatives that are veterans. Uh, but it just, I be, you know, it opened me up to a whole new world I, I didn't know about. And so I learned a lot. I learned a lot about PTSD. And um, fortunately, uh, I, I put out the word through Wounded Warrior Project, you know, to, to find people. And Tayden Hale was the first one to answer the call. And if I hadn't had Tayden, I never would have started because, you know, it always starts with one. <laughs> so it started with Tayden. And um, he's still in our program. This was in 2015. So we're in our sixth year. Uh, we've done a lot of different things. We've been through a lot of uh, great veterans have, have been in our program and still are. Uh, we, we even reached out into other states. We had some in other states. So it didn't have to be local. And we basically train the veterans uh, uh, to, to grow the rose from cuttings. They get all their cuttings from my nursery. And I, I discovered that this little plug was the secret. And this is not something you can just order online. You have to order a big amount of them, you know, like a commercial amount of these. Uh, this is peat. But originally I used to grow my cuttings in a cup like this uh, and in perlite mostly with a little potting soil, holes in the bottom. Um, the reason I brought this, because when I used to do it that way, I would have about a 65% success rate. Uh, but when I found out about these and started using these, um, something different. Okay, so here's, can you see the roots? Okay, what do you think the difference is between these two systems? Huh? Soil? No. Um, no, not the styrofoam. Okay, what happens when you, when you take this out? You take your plant out like this, but, huh? Yes, the roots can go through transplant shock 
And, you know, I'm sure you gardeners, many of you have done that. Many times it dies because now you, it's, it's vulnerable. But with this little plug, you see the roots stay in there. So it never goes through transplant shock. And it loves this little peat uh, thing. And so I noticed that I was having like a 90% success rate. Well, this is good for the veterans because they don't fail. Uh, and they're using, uh, we're using old garden roses that are easy to root. So they will root them at home and we set, they come to my nursery, they learn how to do it. They, they help me in the nursery and they help me root cuttings. And then they go home, we set them up at home. So at their own home, many of the veterans that suffer from PTSD do not uh, work outside the home because it's sometimes very hard. And so they're set up at home and they can grow the roses at their leisure. We give them all the materials to do so. And then they, um, uh, and, th and that first slide that was up there uh, goes on to the, um, goes into the pot when we, so we, when they're done growing their roses and they're full, they bring them back to me. And I buy every single rose they've grown. So now they've brought me 100 roses or 50 roses. Say they bring me 50 roses, now they're getting $5 a rose. So they go away with a $250 check. So I didn't have to sell the roses, I'd just buy them. But I turn around and I sell their roses with the label, homegrown by Heroes label on it, American flag in it, uh, the care and handling. This yellow tag has a, a care, uh, care instructions for organic growing on the back. Uh, and sometimes they have a picture of the rose on it. And those go to garden centers. So uh, um, I've sold them to, um, you know, like different garden centers, some in Jacksonville, some in um, all over, all over Florida. And so they buy like 20 at a time and then they, they resell them. So that money goes back into the bank account of the veterans so that I can pay the next group. You see how it works? So it's very sustainable. And it also became my wholesale company. So if you came to my nursery and you wanted to buy one of their roses, you could, but I have to give that same money to their, to the, their bank account. So I, I buy them wholesale too, in a sense. I'm also reselling them and giving the wholesale money back. Do y'all understand? So it's, it's very, um, uh, it works. So now I would like to uh, bring up Tayden so he can tell you a little bit about his experience uh, coming into the program and what it was like. Um, Tayden has, lives in Orange Park and he and his wife have adopted seven foster children. And they, they, they are the most, the most well-behaved kids I've ever met, I have to say. <laughs> Hello. Hi, I'm Tayden Hill. I'm a U.S. Navy veteran, eight years. Um, I'm also the platoon leader of Jacksonville's The Mission Continuous Platoon, which is a community service organization that does community service projects as well as social engagement. And we also do support projects here in Jacksonville, um, which I'll speak about at the end. We're doing a project with, with Ms. Pam. Um, I came to know Ms. Pam about six years ago with the Wounded Warrior Project where I just signed up on the post for growing roses. Um, my grandmother grew roses growing up and I loved her roses. That's one of the things I remember most about her is just the smell, the smell of roses. So I signed up for the program, not knowing what I was getting into. I would watch her grow them. I tried to grow flowers growing <laughs> up and they just died. <laughs> so I came and came out to Alachua and she showed me, took, gave me a tour, and just being out on the property was like a breath of fresh air, just a natural calming, being in outdoors, uh, seeing all these beautiful flowers and the bees. I mean, everything. It was just nature at its best. And then she showed me how to plug these roses and how to clip them and how to care for them. And I was like, okay, I'm going to take this stuff home. I'm going to try to do this, but they're going to die. <laughs> But she's like, no, you can do it. You can, it, it's, it's much easier than you think. So I call her, I get FaceTime her, text her, and she's like, you got this, you can do it. And then my 
first plug, I pulled it out and I had roots. I was like, I, I did it. So for me, it wasn't just growing the roses. The roses actually grew me because it, it, was, a, it was a success. So being in the military and going through the trauma that we go through, you kind of shut yourself off from the world. You kind of become guarded. So this was my way of just opening back up and giving my energy to something else that can give me energy back. Because a lot of people, you know, will not knowing about flowers, would just buy a flower, you water it, you give it food and you think you hope for the best, but you can't do that with roses. If you want them to grow, you really have to put some time nurturing kindness into it. And then it gives you that back. Um, also with the program, I was able to bring my kids out. So I have seven children, seven adopted children um, from the state of Florida, from Gainesville, from uh, two from Alabama. And they had their own set of trauma. So bringing them out and being around the roses allowed them to see that with just a little bit of love and you know the energy and the, the nature of everything, you can open up to something else as well. So it was healing for them. And then it also brought us together as a family because Miss Pam and her husband took us in as if they were her own grandchildren. And that was amazing. Uh, we've made lots of friends through the veteran program, Growing Roses. She has an, a huge event every year that she invites us out to, no, no charge. It's like a family reunion, it's fantastic. Um, she's become a, a big part of our family over the years. So now in 2021, I am able to give back to Miss Pam and to the, vet the female veteran community we're hosting an event called Her Mission that will be in March at Jenny Springs. And Ms. Pam's gonna bring some of her roses out and teach 30 plus female veterans how to plug roses so we can keep this program going and give back to them as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tayden. Um, yeah, usually I do a proper break propagation workshop with everybody you know where you will I'll come back one day if you want to where we actually do it we grow we do it um the uh one of our veterans Lane said one time Tayden reminded me um that uh, you know they're so veterans are so used to the killing uh to learning to kill being trained to kill and this program is being trained to heal to be, be for life this is to live, this, so that it make it's the opposite of that. Um, Lane also, I like to tell a story. Uh, he came uh, when he first started. He went to the nursery for a few hours. I wasn't even there. I said, just go and walk around for a few hours, and um, he did. But a few months later, I found out the story that he had done that, and then he went to uh, Sam's Club to meet with his wife, and. Um, he sat in the truck and he broke down and just had a, like a little nervous breakdown, crying, crying, crying. But he hadn't done that in five years since he'd been home. So that, so what ha he had a big reaction from walking around in the, all the blooms because roses are uh, healing. And there is a measurement of roses. They measure plants and thing, uh, in megahertz and roses are vibrating at 320 megahertz, which is the highest vibration of any uh, plant. And the next plant down is 180. And just for perspective, people are vibrating at 65 megahertz. So this is why roses are, are so synonymous with love because they raise our vibration. And this is why this horticulture therapy with roses is so valuable. And this is what happened to Lane. He, 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 and it happened to Tayden, like he said, when you go out there and you smell the roses and remember they're all organic, there's been no chemicals used. So there's nothing but insects everywhere and you know, butterflies and you know, nothing's dead. It's all living, living, living. Uh, we also team up with um, the uh, Veterans Healing Farm in Hendersonville, North Carolina. We've done a couple of big programs there. I took one of our veterans, uh, Lorenzo, up there with me and we put in a big rose garden. And they grow food with all the veterans around there. Um, it's a nonprofit and they, they give away all the food at the veterans hospital. So we're real close to that group. Um, they've supported us, we've supported them. 
we had a veteran who committed suicide. And, and you know, and he also had about seven or eight children too, um, 45 years old. So, I mean, it's touched us. This PTSD has touched us personally. And it really is a real, a real thing. I think in the old days, you know, it was uh, in the early, you know, before it was called PTSD, it was other things. They called it something else. Um, so now, before I move into just talking about roses for a minute, oh, and, and we, I'm, we have in the raffle three roses. I call them Rosa Mysteriosa because these are three of the roses that uh, one of our veterans turned in that didn't have a label on it because they do lose their labels sometimes and they learn real fast not to lose labels because guess what happens when they don't have a label on them? What do you think? They don't get paid. <laughs> so this teaches them real fast to not to keep up with their labels, but what I'll, I'll have a whole batch of roses they grew that didn't have any labels on it. So as soon as, the, as I can identify it, then I, then I give them the money. <laughs> but anyway, um, if you get one of those raffle roses, just give me a, a, a picture when it blooms and I'll try to identify it for you. Okay, that, I'm just telling you that ahead of time. Um, hey, Pam, before you start talking about Rose Care, did you want to talk about some of the people in your slides? Yes, let's do that. So th let's go through the slides real quick before I get on to the other. So this is a typical, um, you know, scene at any of our homes that are growing the roses. It just takes a little bit of space. It doesn't take much space. Um, and we give them all these supplies, the, the, you know, everything they need. Okay, next. This uh, is Lorenzo and Jeffrey. Jeffrey lives in Stark and Lorenzo lives in uh, Dun Allen. So everybody's spread out, you know, pretty far. Uh, actually, Tayden's the closest one right here. Uh, he does all my programs around <laughs> Jacksonville. <laughs> And this is Jeffrey with the load of roses that he just brought to me. Uh, he unloaded his car and we're taking them to the back. And then when they come to bring their roses, they also get cuttings. They get more cuttings. They get more. They go home with more plugs, more cuttings. Uh, what do they need? Pots, fertilizer, whatever they need, they take. And this is all paid for by the nonprofit. Okay. Next one. This is Lane. Uh, uh, the one I was telling you about that broke down at, at Sam's, he, he was growing them in his greenhouse. Uh, he, he actually had a degree in horticulture at UF. So this guy could grow roses. I mean, he, he grew them better than I did. I, I was so impressed. I, I'm very impressed with his roses. And this is uh, Lorenzo again. This is Peggy Martin Rose. He's standing next to, which I have one here for sale. It's a climber, it's a house eater, um, and it's probably the most popular rose in the country. Southern Living writes about a it all the time. A house eater? Huh? A house eater? A house eater. So it's a climber that Peggy, devours. Peggy Martin is a friend of mine in, uh, from New Orleans, and she was in uh, Katrina, you know, and she had like a garden of 10 years with all the old roses, a gorgeous garden, and it all got wiped out, completely wiped out. And after four months, she went back and there was one rose growing out through the mud and the salt water, and it was this rose. And this rose had been given to her by a 90-year-old lady, the cutting. So it's a really old rose. Nobody really knew the name of it ever. Somebody named it uh, after her, Peggy Martin, because it became a very famous rose. And it was grown, it's grown all over the country to raise money for Katrina victims. And um, her parents died in that flood because they wouldn't leave. So the... The bigger tragedy is she lost her parents, but you know the Peggy Martin rose is very famous. So for what's the name of the rose again? Peggy Martin. Peggy Martin. Peggy okay. Martin. It's grown all over. We we've been growing it for years and years and years. You know everybody. Uh, it's just a great rose, and it's a repeat rambler. Most repeat rose, most ramblers don't repeat, but this one repeats all year. Um, okay, so are there any questions about the program and the, that anybody, I just, oh, keep going because yeah. I want to show that. So this is Lorenzo's house uh, in Donnell, and he, had, he lives in a tiny shed that he created for himself, and he has, he's growing them there, and he does composting. He has a big composting business. Um, so you see the blue pots. Those are all our, our roses. We were, um, when I first started, I wanted to dif differentiate our, 
you know, the my roses from the veteran roses. And I, it, this is how God works. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I didn't even know I had to do that. But one company that I buy the colored pots from, I asked them if they had any, if they could discount or, you know, what could they do? And the guy says, well, actually somebody um, ordered this color and they didn't like them. And there's 4,200 of them in a pallet. And we're going to give them to you. Well, this jump started the whole program. I mean, this really was something. And so ever since then, this light blue periwinkle was our signature color. So I can look out in my nursery and I know which roses are from the veterans. See, I know, oh, that's a veteran rose. So on your ticket, I have to write a V and I have to give that money. So this is how I keep track of who's what from these colors. So it was pretty amazing that that, that happened. This is, uh, who is that? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that is a, a couple from um, uh, North Carolina that were, that were and, and the other cool thing that happened when I first started the program, Tayden's a Navy, was Navy. The next person was Air Force. The next person was Army. The next person was um, Marine. And the next person was National Guard. I mean, we had one from every branch of the military. It was just so interesting the way it happened, you know, and the way I got to be a, see how all those different things came together. And everybody got to know each other. We do have one gathering every year. Um, this is our latest. Uh, she came to uh, buy roses from me the other day from Belle. And she has um, a prosthesis for a leg. And she and her husband are both Army. And um, she knew about my program. She asked me about the program. We talked about it. And um, at the end of her visit, it hit me like, duh. I said, hey, would you be interested? You know, and she's, she said, yeah, I might be. So she came back yesterday to get her roses that she had ordered. I said, are you in? Did you think about it? She said, yes, I want to do it. So we're going to set her up. She lives in Bell. And her husband will help. They're both veteran, and uh, he'll help set her up. So she's our newest veteran, just to come on. And this is my cuttings, my own situation. Okay, next. Is that it? That's it. Okay. Questions now about the program or anything like that? Well, we have some questions on Zoom. Zoom. Okay. So I'll go ahead and serve those up to you and while you're thinking of them. And uh, we do have a microphone up there so that uh, you can uh, go and ask your question. Um, the biggest question that everybody's asking is, can we come visit? Where are you located? Yes. So I am in Alachua, Florida, um, near Gainesville, about 15 minutes. And we go from Jacksonville, you go the back way, um, you know, to McClinney. You basically get off one of the McClinney exits and go 121 to the back road. It's all back roads to my house, to my place. It takes about an hour and 15, 20 minutes from here. But anyway, you can also go online to angelgardens.com. Now, my uh, sons, two boys who live in Asheville, just finished a brand new website. They're, they're web designers. And the website has had a few kinks. So if you go there, um, you know, you may, you'll have to email me. Uh, anyway, just know that in a few days, it'll be all worked out. <laughs> but, you know, go there. That's you. I do appointments. So you just make an appointment with me by text, email, phone call, and uh, you come out as a group any way you want to do. We have a beautiful new property. Um, I lived over the hill for 36 years, and uh, we just moved to a brand new place, and it's a beautiful I have a beautiful 1859 uh, Cracker Mansion house a mile away from the nursery. So I have roses in both places. It's fun to go to both, actually. Yeah. Um, so uh, we just put the contact information in Zoom. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and there's also brochures. Make sure you pick one up uh, on your way out. Uh, but uh, so one of the questions we've gotten in Zoom is, um, I've tried. I haven't had much luck. Okay. So give them like All the right. best... So now we'll scenario. get into the rose talk. So, you know, most people, I would say, do not, everybody thinks they can't grow roses. And um, it's, there's, there's a reason, I'm going to tell you why people think that. Uh, I am one of only two organic commercial rose nurseries in the United States. 
I'm only one of four in the whole entire world. And you say, why is that? It must be so hard. No, absolutely not. <laughs> the opposite is true. It's the easiest thing in the whole world to do, but people don't realize it. So most that means that every rose you buy, unless you bought it from me or the person on the West Coast, it has been heavily over-medicated. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever, you know the story of the drug addict is on the side of the road and you might want to bring them home and help them out. And you do. And then they steal all your money and take everything you have. And, and then you just try to get them into rehab. And, you know, that, it's the same story with the rose. You're going to bring that rose home that's done, had nothing but chemical fertilizer and sprays all its whole life. Every 10 days, every in the water it drinks. And it is nothing but a drug addict. So when you get it home and you don't have its fix and its drug of choice and it's what it's used to getting, and yes, it looks beautiful when you get it because it just got sprayed, and then you get it home, and then what happens? Within three weeks, it's going down, down, down. You don't know what to do. It's dying. Believe me, it happens to me too. And then before you know it, it's dead. Oops, sorry, I got to silence my phone. There, let me get that off. Okay. Anyway, so that is the truth. This is, this is all true stuff. Um, and I, 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 you know, I'm not judging anybody, okay? But if you were to, 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 to know, if you would just go in any Lowe's or Home Depot or anywhere and you, you pull some of these fungicides and chemicals off the shelf and you read the ingredients and then you go home and you look up those ingredients and you start reading about the research and you will see how dangerous this stuff is that we are all spraying our yards and everything else with and you can't suit up enough to keep it away you know from you and there are many rose growers who spray their roses religiously every week and they die of cancer and no one puts these two together, okay? Nobody talks about this, but it's true. So the reason that, and I've always been an organic gardener. I mean, I've never known any different. I, I'm just sort of that, I am that. So, you know, I'm not able to poison the earth or myself. And so once you realize the secret, and there's, there's several secrets, and, and they're, so, uh, they're so obvious, really, when you think about it. When you know that 95% of all insects seen by the eye and unseen, the microbes in the soil, they're all good guys. They're all good. This is the divine intelligence of nature. Nature was designed with all these insects to be good. Even the 5% bad insects are good because they each also eat other bad insects. So 5% only are bad. So what happens when we use an osmocote, which is numbers 30s and 40s? So every number over 10 kills microbes. So 10, 10, 10, you know, is okay, but then every number hotter, miracle Grow, uh, all, your, all your hot, chemical fertilizers kill because they're in the high, high numbers. They burn, burn, burn. So they're killing all these microbes in the soil. And then we don't have an army to take care of our plants. The army is dead. So like, and then people will say, well, I use organic, you know, compost. I use black cow and my roses, you know, aren't help, you know. Well, you can't have an army of 1 million microbes. You have to have an army of 20,000 billion microbes. So when you actually let them live. So I, I tell you the truth, and this is another uh, wonderful fact, is that the way nature was designed is first comes the pest and then comes the predator. So what happens? The pest comes to our gardens, what do we do? We pull out the arsenal, start spraying everything we got, and we kill all the good guys that would have come in two weeks later to eat everything. So a perfect example is thrips. Do you all know what thrips are? Flower thrips? Okay. Well, flower thrips is one of the 
people who grow roses know. So thrips come in early spring and they're teeny little um, sucking insects that crawl all over the petals. And light colored roses look like they've been burned along the edges in the early spring and you don't know what happened. It's these thrips that are sucking the juices out of them and they particularly show up on the light colored roses. Um, so everybody sprays the heck out of them and you know they never really get rid of them because the life cycle falls in the soil and they just keep on going. But if you can tie your hands behind your back and not do anything, then in two weeks, here comes the predator. And then you say to me, well, what's their predators? Probably a thousand different insects eat thrips. I, you know, in the early spring, when you start seeing all the, any kind of aphid, any, any kind of new nests of things, this is the pests coming first. So you wouldn't sit your child down at the table with no food, right? Is going to get real bored and walk away. You have to have the food there. Well, that's what nature does. It puts the food out in quantity. And then we wait, and here comes all the predators to eat it. But they can't eat it if they're been killed. They can't eat it if they're dead. So that's the, that's the whole thing about organic gardening. If you let your, so every single year that I started from the beginning of growing roses, I would see tons of thrips for maybe three, four, five weeks. I did nothing every year, less thrips, less thrips, less thrips till now I might have them for a week. I'm happy because they feed the predators, but every, I never see aphids, never, ever, ever. I bring in ladybugs uh, every other year. There's a wonderful place, y'all, if you got my pink booklet, it has in there some of these names, Arbico Organics. You can get any kind of predator you want, you can buy it, bring it in. One time, and this is a sad Master Gardener story, you'll be interested. <laughs> you know, I, I left my nursery for 10 days one time, uh, with, and I left it with a young person who didn't really know what to, to do enough, and he didn't do anything. So I came back, and it was a nightmare. I mean, because, you know, the way I work is I go around my nursery every day. I'm round robin, cutting off bad leaves. I throw away the black spot leaves in the garbage. Uh, I put them in containers and throw them away. So I'm constantly taking off bad things, physically, manually taking them away. Then I'm not spreading spores. That's the key. Um, so I left. I came back, and it was horrible. I had aphids up the wazoo. I had, I had thrips. I, had, I was afraid I might have chili thrips. I've never had gotten chili thrips in my nursery, which is a curse. I, I, didn't, I thought I might. I might have rose rosette disease. I didn't, I didn't know. It was horrible. Everything looked terrible. I thought, I'm going to have to get something strong, like chemical, and use it. And, but I decided, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to order beneficial insects. So I called Arbico, I got lacewing larvae, I got um, ladybugs, I got pirate bugs. Does anybody know what pirate? Well, in the magazine, in the catalog, pirate bug looks like it's this big, and it says it bites. And I, but the pirate bugs, you could barely see them. They were teeny, but they had blown it up, you know, with a magnifying glass on the in the catalog, but I had to laugh at myself because I really thought I was gonna get these giant bugs. But they were tiny little bugs. I let them all go. I've even brought in uh, praying mantis, which are really exciting. Um, and I, you, so you don't have to have all these insects in your yard, you just can bring them in. And nowadays they have food for these insects. So even after they're, they're finished eating all your insects, they can stick around because you're feeding them. And, um, I, within five days, my nursery was completely back to normal. I mean, five days, it was over. Everything had been back, looking beautiful, no, no chili trips. <laughs> but I did call my plant inspector out because I was so worried about rose rosette disease. And they did a, um, I was supposed to speak to the state master gardeners convention that week and planning to bring all the roses and give this big talk. And uh, when she came back, she says, um, you have a mite that has never been discovered before in Florida. It's a state record. <laughs> what? So 
you know, you have to get all your facts straight, right? Because, you know, I'm thinking, oh, God, this is the mite that causes Rose Rosette disease. And, you know, and but, but then I come, I had to track down this entomologist who happened to be the only entomologist on, on staff. He's one of the few in the whole country that uh, can identify this mite because it's so tiny that nobody knows anything about it. So I finally, they put me under quarantine. They said, you can't sell any roses, you can't, you know, cause they don't, they didn't know anything about it. And so I had to cancel my speech. I was so upset. I don't know why I canceled it. I could have still spoke, but I couldn't bring any roses. See? So anyway, but then I found out from the entomologist that it wasn't a bad mite. It was just a mite. It could have been one of the 5% good mite. You know, it could have been a good mite. I don't, they didn't know. They just knew that it, they didn't know. So um, they lifted the quarantine a few days later. It was really no big deal. <laughs> It was just that this one guy knew how to identify it. So that was just a funny little story that happened to me. But um, anyway, um, so yeah. Getting back to one of the key themes here, yeah. which is, you know, I, I've tried, I've failed. Yeah. You know, and the, the um, discussion about, uh, you know, chemicals is well taken and, and okay. very, very important. So once you've now, eliminated the chemicals from the equation, what next? All right, now I wanna talk about um, um, why own root? Why own root roses? And what the difference is between the, an own root rose and a, and a grafted or budded rose. So does everybody know the difference between the two? If you don't, raise your hand and I'm gonna explain it. Okay. Well, the rose that's on top, the one you buy at the store that you want is called the Skyon. And I'm going to give you that term because I'm going to use it. So the Skyon is the one on top, the one we want, the ones here that you're buying. So I grew this rose from its own root. And that means I took a cutting like right here off of a big rose. And I made a clone of it, basically. And that clone came from this rose is from the early, early 1800s. So every person that took a clone off of every rose since the 1800s ends up right here. This is the same rose that was living in the 1800s. Do you understand that? That's what's so exciting about this. It's so historical. So these roses are, are the exact same. But something interesting about roses, you can, uh, any rose you take a cutting from, you grow the same rose from that. But if I grew the seeds, the hips, and I took the hips and I grew seed, it's gonna always be a different rose. It's gonna always be a new rose. It's like our children. Okay, they're all different, you know? It's the same with a rose hip and I can explain how to grow roses from seeds. We're getting off track, but the interesting thing about God, too, is that all the wild roses, wild species roses that God put on the earth to start with, about 280 varieties, are dot something. These are wild roses. Their seed is a clone of themselves. So the wild rose will never be able to be lost, you see? It's always, this, the seed is always going to reproduce the mother the same. But anything else after that is a hybrid rose, is hybridized. It's not the same wild rose, okay? So those seeds won't. So own root will live over 100 years or more. There's no end. But a grafted rose will live five years to 10 years, maybe 15 if you're lucky. And there's a reason for it, which is interesting. Most of the, so the bottom of the, the, the rose that's, that's grafted, I don't have any grafted roses here, but the bottom of it is a different rose. So that's called the rootstock. That's just like a, a citrus tree that has a rootstock. Same thing, it's grafted. So why do they graft it? They do it because many, many roses are weak, weak links. And I try to grow that rose on its own roots and, and I have terrible luck. I can't root it, it won't do anything. So they will take that rose and stick it on another rose 
that is a vigorous grower that grows fast and hard. And those roses are usually ramblers that'll go 20 feet in all direction like Peggy Martin. And that will usually bloom one time a year for six weeks. They put all their energy into getting big, big, big. Do you know what the Cherokee rose is? It's a giant rose in Florida that, that, that's famous because it was on the uh, Trail of Tears. So um, they, they use these roots, these for rootstock. So Fortuniana, you've all heard of Fortuniana. Fortuniana is a rootstock rose. Well, people order a Fortuniana from me on its own roots. They just want Fortuniana for its own self because it is a pretty rose when it's in bloom. Um, so they use Fortuniana for a reason because it's, they say it's resistant to nematodes. Now here's the nematode story. 95% of all nematodes are good nematodes. So I get my nursery tested every single year because I ship roses. I'm primarily a mail order nursery uh, and, and my daughter lives here. So anytime you want roses, I can bring roses to Jacksonville. You don't have to ship just so you know. But um, Fortuniana um, is the reason they call it, you know, uh, resistant is because it's shallow rooted. And all of the 5% bad nematodes are anaerobic. They're way under the soil deep, two, two feet down. So the shallow rooted Fortuniana never gets near those nematodes that are bad. And if the person's soil is dead from chemical use, then they may have a nematode problem if they, because there's no good nematodes to keep the bad nematodes at bay. And so now you have a rose on Fortuniana rootstock that's so shallow rooted, they have to hold it up with rebar. And because it's, uh, um, because these um, ramblers bloom once a year, what's happening is the rose on top, the sky on, is forcing the one on the bottom to bloom all year. So it's unnatural and it's, it's exhausting the rootstock. Do you understand that? That's why the rootstock will die. That's why it will not live even with the best of care. Most of us cannot take good care of grafted roses because, because they also get many diseases. So where the two come together, the, where the graft, the bud union and the uh, scion come together is sort of a, a, a calling card for bacteria. So they can get cancers and different problems there. Also up north, um, they have to treat their roses almost many times as annuals because the freezes kill that graft, that bud unit. They have to replant. Whereas if you have your own rooted rose and it dies down to the ground, it can come back the same rose from the roots, you see? So there's so many advantages and now I have a little fun um, question I'm going to ask the audience here. Um, who knows? I'm going to tell you this is all rose societies in America will tell you never do this, but I'm going to tell you to do this. So this is a myth you should, we're busting. We are going, this is what all of Europe does. I'm not making it up. All of Europe, they like to have grafted roses because it makes the rose big fast and this is commercial this is done because of commercial they need to make roses fast that's why they do it so much that's why you can only find uh, grafted roses in in the stores and not own root you have to go to specialty nurseries usually to get own root roses because it's slower it's like slow food it takes longer you see to grow but it's a thousand times better so what they do in Europe is they take the um, graft and when they plant the rose, they bury the graft under the ground, two to three inches. If you're in a cold climate, four to five inches deep. Why do they do this? Who knows? Anyone? Just yell out if you know. No. She said to protect the rose. That is true. It does protect from freeze. Say what? 
No, but close. No. What, what can the rose on top now be able to do? What? I, I can't hear. No, no. The one underneath, thank you. On, what did you say? That's right. So the one on top now can make its own roots because it's under the soil. It's not three inches above the soil. You see the difference? And the rootstock dies away. Two years, it's gone. Now we have an own root rose that's big, beautiful, has many basil, you know, and sending out lots of shoots, able to be strong and live forever. You see the difference? So Daniel, would you please hand this rose prize to that lady <laughs> that, that gave the correct answer? Thank you. That's great. All right, so um, we're going to have to wrap up soon here. So okay, if you where could uh, give us some final thoughts. Okay, now the last thing I want to say that's very important is that the roses are talked about in classes. Oh, and, and just so you know, there's about 70 or 80,000 varieties of roses. Of those, you have two big classes, modern roses and old fashioned antique heirloom roses. What's the difference? The difference is these classes that they all belong to. We in Florida happen to be super lucky and we don't know this because we can grow the most beautiful classes of the old garden roses. These are the teas, the chinas, the bourbons, the polyanth. There's many different, maybe about 10 different classes. The 1867 was when the very first hybrid tea was created. And this was all of a sudden this lollipop rose that in the old days, the roses would hang like this a little very romantically. But then all of a sudden they got this rose that's on a long stem and it's standing up like this with a big bloom on top. That was the beginning of the modern rose. So all throughout history, you may have many modern roses, say in the early 1900s, that did very well, like Queen Elizabeth. Maybe she was bred in, uh, eight, in 19, say 30 or 40, and she was doing great, and she still does great, and rose, nurseries like mine still grow her, but nobody else does, because what happens is these big rose companies like Jackson and Perkins, for instance, put out brand new roses every year and they get rid of all the old, you know, oh, that's last year's rose. So you don't see that rose anymore. But all the really good roses from the past, even if they are modern roses, aren't grown anymore. You see? So it doesn't mean you can't grow a hybrid tea. You just want to look for the best of the, of the rose hybrid teas that were in the past. And, and they don't get disease like like the ma, you know, and then you have what, what these modern roses are is, is two different types of classes of old roses that were bred together and that became the first hybrid tea. Then they took the hybrid tea, which is a one rose on one stem, they crossed it with an old polyantha, which is little multiple little roses, like the drift roses, that's what a polyantha is like, and then they created a floribunda. So a floribunda is a cross between the old polyantha with the hybrid tea, and they created multiple but bigger blooms. You see? And um, so if you will start with old garden roses, they, they're better than knockout. They just don't get black spot. Chinas and teas do not get black spot. People in... Um, Georgia, in, in uh, cold climates, can't grow them unless they grow in a greenhouse because they love the heat and humidity so much. And these roses are just like your azaleas in your yard. They make giant flowering shrubs that bloom all year. Some are small, some are big. But this is these are the types of roses you, if you have trouble growing roses, these are the types of roses you need to, to be growing on their own roots. 
This is fascinating. I feel like um, we could do a whole Ancestry.com of Rose's <laughs> we program. We could. There's uh, some serious <laughs> historical, uh, you know, stories about these roses. 23 and Me Rose <laughs> like, program. Like, for, I want to just say one thing fun that um, when Josephina Bonaparte, she, she was instrumental in creating a huge amount of, of roses in the early 1800s because she collected every rose there was. And when they had the big war between England and in France, and she was getting her roses from an English nursery. All the um, ships were blockaded and couldn't get through. They wouldn't let any ships through. But the one ship that had her roses on it could come through. They let that one ship come through because it was bringing the roses to Josephine. <laughs> she had to get her roses. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you and Tayden for being being here today. This is um, so fabulous. We have learned um, so much from uh, you today. And uh, could we give them both a big hand, both in person and on Zoom? So Lots were there any more questions? No more questions? Right. So Good. we do need to close up at this point. Okay. Um, we are, if you hold on, uh, if you're here in person, we do have a, um, some roses that uh, we're going to give away on the raffle. So wait for that announcement. I'm going to do a few housekeeping things here online. So um, if you want to get in touch with Pam, um, we'll be sending out uh, the recording of this program along with her contact information. But uh, here it is here for you on Zoom uh, and also um, here in person. Um, the uh, Rose Garden Angels um, website and the Angel Gardens website. Um, learn more about them and please buy some roses and support the work that they're doing. Uh, speaking of which, the littler ones are 15 and the big ones are 20, including tax. Um, there's modern, old roses and veteran grown roses and um, they're all on their own roots. Yeah, and if you're here in person, um, you can take advantage of that. And uh, if you can't be here in person, um, as Pam said, she has a daughter who lives here, and so she's uh, willing to do some delivery here in person. All right, um, I just want to tell you about a couple of things coming up. We have, um, I always get this wrong, Camp Wakiva, Camp Wakiva. I feel like it's Wakiva, Wakiva, let's call the whole thing off, um, is uh, our Combined Circles program a week from today on March 9th. Uh, we have Tina Tuttle, who will be speaking about this fantastic nature camp that uh, the Garden Club of Jacksonville um, helps support, along with the rest of the Florida Federation of Garden Clubs. So come check that out on March 9th. Uh, we have our continuing flower show series, and this one is Contemporary Designs. Laura Haley will be demonstrating some beautiful flower show designs um, in the contemporary class. Uh, that's on March 11th. We have our budding gardeners program. Uh, this one will be called Starting Sprouts. It's all about uh, propagation. So whether you're cutting uh, plants, much like uh, Pam talked about today, or starting them from seeds, uh, this is a great way to teach your young one how to do that. And we have our Fun with Flowers program on March 23rd. Uh, Sarath McKinnon and Kari Hartley um, um, from Soulful Stems are doing a great program and they're gonna be making this beautiful uh, gift box. Uh, coming up on April 9th, our Blooms Galore and More uh, is a fantastic plant sale. And we have a preview party on April 9th. And the main event is on April 10th and that will be a campus-wide sale and um, lots of vendors of environmentally friendly items and uh, kids zone and all sorts of fun things, food trucks. So come check us out on April 10th. And Daniel's putting some of those links into the chat if you're on Zoom and you can always visit our website, gardenclubjacks.org slash events. And then one of the main events that uh, we're looking forward to this year is our designer of distinction. Um, fantastic floral designer, Ashley Woodson Bailey will be this year's designer of distinction on May 13th. Uh, she is an amazing uh, floral arranger, but she also photographs her pieces and turns them into wallpaper and fabrics and other beautiful products. And she'll be showing us not only her floral arranging skills, but how she does that with the photographs and turns them into these beautiful prints. So that's May 13th. We do surveys of all of our programs because we really want to get your feedback. So we're putting the link to that in the Zoom. You'll also be getting it in an email after the program. 
please take the survey. Your feedback really helps us improve our programs and tells us how we're doing. And also you can give us ideas for programs in the future, like the 23andMe horticulture program, I think would be really fun. All right. Um, once, once again, I want to thank the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund for their support for programs like this. And I want to thank Daniel, uh, my colleague here in the ballroom making this happen, and all of you who are here in person and all of you on Zoom. We're so happy to have you. We wouldn't do this without you because we'd just be talking to ourselves and that would be not much fun. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day and see you next time.